Super Arcade Racing, Bird and Blend Tea, and Return of the Obra Din. This is staying in. Okay, so, Pete. Yes, hi. Uh, it's, it's just you and I. It is you and me together. Just the tuna bus. Just the tuna bus. So, what have you been up to, Chris? I mean, obviously, we've, we, we, there was um, oh, there was something on the week, uh, on the weekend, wasn't it? The wedding, some, Sam's wedding or something along those lines. Like yeah. Wedding decompression. Which is why one of our number isn't here. He's currently honeymooning in Bali. Sent us a wonderful picture of him in helmet and life jacket. Um, apparently, he's just been... Boating or kayaking in Bali or something, I don't know. He's done a fancy pants, like, oat cuisine top flight tasting menu thing. And I'm sure he's done some other stuff as well. So uh, I'm sure he'll give us the scoop, the hot scoop on uh, that when he gets back. And I hope he's having fun. He better be. It's Bali. It's I know. Lovely. It's paradise. Yes. Sounds fantastic, yeah. Yes. Yeah. What did you do after the wedding? How did you, like, decompress? Letting go was quite tricky because I didn't realise until after I finished my best man speech mm. how much tension I had been holding, mm. not just in my head but also in my whole body. It was just like I was suddenly aware of how relaxed my body could be. I didn't realise that. What I thought was a default relaxed state just wasn't really. And I think it's one of those badges of honour. Once you've done a best man speech, you become part of an illustrious group. Oh, definitely. And Sam had told me about it was the most nervous he'd ever felt. And, yeah, I, I think since then, this weekend has just been relaxing. Um, went running yesterday, trying to chalk up some points on this Charity Miles app. Mm. Did a nice hike yesterday in the Peak District where something lovely happened to me, Pete. Go on, tell me all about it. We're getting to the end of the walk, and I see, like, an oasis in a desert a night scream van and partly as a child I thought because of the amount of food I eat that, that I imagine they just follow me everywhere sure <laughs> just apply their trade keeping your top down and, and, I, and I didn't have any cash on me mm. and I just said to the guy I said I know mate this is a stupid question but do you take card and he was like ah no I don't sorry mate and he looked at me and goes what do you want what is it you want and I said just an ice cream a 99 he said I'll do you one so he did me a free 99 a free 99 ice cream. and he sensed that uh, my partner and I were going to share it so he gave us an extra flake oh. and then, then he just rode off into the sunset didn't ride off what am I talking about he wasn't on the back of a horse he, he drove off into the sunset yeah. and I just gave him a salute did you manage to catch his name? Is, I assume his name is something like Mr. Whippy or something. I like don't that. know, but if you head towards the Roaches in the Peak District, this lovely walking route down there, it's a blue ice cream van, a lovely gentleman. I said, next time I go there, I'll give him a tip of some sort because the amount of money I paid with him was just loose shrapnel from the wedding change, actually, from the bar at Sam Lisa's wedding. And I'm pretty sure I may have accidentally also paid with one of the spare buttons for my trousers <laughs> that was in there that we'd bought. What a, so, what a magical... What a lovely act of human kindness. And, and, and that ice cream tasted so much nicer, not because it was free, but because no. it was given, you know, as a gift. Yeah. And it becomes infectious then. And we had the, we had the sun shining and we were just walking back. We only got a little bit lost because it was me navigating and we made our way back to the car. So here's the thing. I'm a great believer in do unto others and, like, pass, passing it on, right? So what are you going to do, Chris? to pass that lovely little bit of karma back out into the world like what are you gonna how are you going to make somebody else's day as joyful as yours it's a very good question i think i'm gonna wait till i get to those situations where like um if i see someone because i've done it before briefly like and some people have done it for me where you're struggling to pay you haven't got the exact change for something yes and stepping in and saying that not stepping in. Stepping in sounds a bit too theatrical. Yeah. Like, say, excuse me, I've got this. <laughs> You're the hero. Uh, two pence you want? There you go. Yeah. Um, doing something like that. Or, you know, if somebody is on their way back to return their shopping trolley, giving them the quid and say, look, I'll take this trolley, save so you having to walk all that way. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. So little things like that. And I do like to think like you, Pete, that I, I, I'm receptive to these moments, these mm. circumstances. Mm. Not as good as I could be, but I am receptive to them nonetheless. And something like that yesterday with the ice cream van, you could have just closed the shutter and said, sorry, mate, and just eaten an ice cream in front of us, but he yeah, didn't. But he didn't. 
I like the idea of taking in this goodness, magnifying it back out, right? So, like, if something really nice happens to me, what I try to do is do something twice as good back out with the hope that, yeah, that somebody, like, passes that along as well and, like, takes yeah. that idea. Oh, it's so lovely. Do you know what? People can be lovely, can't they? Like, you think it might a conversation might go one way and a, the conversation goes in a completely different way. It is, it is lovely. Talking of that, a mate of mine got his phone nicked when he went to EGX because it was on the phone. No f- way. Yeah, I know. So, basically... I went to uh, EGX Resed. When was it? Last week? When was that? Whenever EGX Res was. It was a yeah, it was about a week ago now. Uh, as a time of recording and I went uh, with the company what I work at and uh, we went to go and show a couple of the games that we're working on because they're coming out real soon and yeah so the marketing manager of my studio was he put his phone down on the side in the bathroom for two minutes because he wanted to wash his hands walked away a bit silly but like then came back within 30 seconds gone just no way. ghosted and it's clearly been formatted as well because you know you get those little apps that tell you like where your phone is gone hasn't even checked in so people could be nice and people can steal your phone wouldn't it be incredible if it was my ice cream van driver what a twist yeah what a twist That's crazy. So how, what was it like going to that place as oh. a developer, as a producer, say, as, a developer, as opposed to being a journalist? You know, a player, yeah. Or a player. For example. Yeah, okay. So um so it was interesting. I so we went as like normal punters, but as developers. So we only got like normal tickets and stuff like that. And the reason that we went there is because we wanted to show our game to a couple of people behind closed doors, essentially. So we made a few meetings with uh, nice journalists and stuff like that to, to play our play our stuff. And it is interesting when you go to these events as a just a fan, right? So when I go to I can't do it for video game events anymore, but when I go to board game events, so I've booked my tickets now for UK Games Expo, which is a primarily oh, table so event. I know, I'm very excited. Very excited, Chris. When I go there, I get very excited. I want all the swag. Like, I want to pick up everything I possibly can. Like, if somebody's giving away a piece of tat, I want it. I want to go and look at every single table. I want to go and play every single game and have a really nice time. And I don't want to look after myself. I want to. I want to. I don't want to eat healthy meals or anything like that, or, or drink water. I want to just go and see absolutely everything I can, then return home exhausted. So it's a bit like the purge, but for your own body. Yeah, basically, I would say that that is comparable. So, so for board game events, I get very excited. But video game events, because I've been to so many now as like a critic and then as a developer, they don't really hold any mystique. So, like you see, it was amazing. We went on. The th- I went on the Thursday, and you see, like you know, delinquents because it's a Thursday. <laughs> see delinquents like wandering around, and they're like, "Oh my god, mate! There's <laughs> whatever." Uh, Devolver's new game and you'd be like brilliant like great go and play it mate and like they'd be so excited and they'd go and sit in there like the Argos had a stand because they were selling stuff from Argos like laptops and like they were selling games uh, and all sorts of other bits and pieces gaming headsets and stuff and Argos also just had a bank of like Fortnite set up that they just set up themselves and they were just like kids who were in there playing Fortnite because they were just excited to be in and amongst even though you can get Fortnite you know it wasn't a special developer build or anything like that it was just Fortnite on a screen and people just hanging out and playing games and enjoying games you know whereas my my mindset was like I could do that at home but there were people who were really really excited about it but the the thing that you realize as a developer as as a as a as a critic is people are there to some people are there to do business with business people and some people are there to show their game to the public and some are doing a bit of a mix of both and the stress that goes into an event like that for everybody who's actually making the stuff and like selling the stuff and criticizing the stuff is actually massive so when you're when you're a member of the press and you go to an event like that like you're going to try and see as much as you possibly can because some of those games are unreleased you want to you know write these things up really quickly and of course you know like yeah, you want to get a, you want to get across that stuff really really quickly. So it can be really long. And, and indeed, you know, five or six years ago when I was doing that stuff, I would have gone and then spent you know hours and hours and hours in the evening just writing that stuff up to go back and do it all again. And and that was fun. As a developer, you're sort of wandering around seeing where everything's at. Like the cool thing was like seeing our old publisher and seeing what they were up to and like what they're working on now and then seeing. Um, some developer pals that you have and like people from... So it is a bit like a wedding. It's a bit like a wedding in that you like catch up with people and 
you know, you gossip and you talk about everything that's going on in the industry and you have a very different experience to the one that the like average player has. Because the average player is kind of disconnected from the developer, right? The average player is like, turn up, sit down, play the game, go, oh, I really enjoyed that. And then you go, ah, cool, cheers, thanks very much. And then you don't really have much of a conversation because you want the next person to play the game. Or if you have a bit of a conversation, that's great. But like, you don't, that person doesn't usually turn around and say, so, you know, like, what do you think about, what do you think about all these microtransactions that are happening at the moment or like oh that 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 like those activision layoffs are a bit nasty like you don't really have those conversations but yeah so you get to go and see other people's games and i caught up with people in from from bristol and from abroad who and from different parts of the country and stuff like that who were developers who hadn't seen for a while went to go and hang out with the uk games fund people so again that was just away from the show floor and it's a very different event and you don't really get to play much you tend to or at least i tend to only play like a few things and they really have to like grab my interest like they really really have to and so you know and do you do this research in advance no i, I no i just i just wander and i see things I, I tend to just see the thing and i go oh that's exciting and i'll go and play that for 10 minutes so like yeah when we did the gamescom episode for example you know a few months ago like i talked about the one game that i went and played that i particularly like from that thing and then that tends to be how how i do do these events it was really cool uh even though my mate got his phone nicked it isn't full of thieves and scoundrels it's just you know it's a public event and you shouldn't leave your phone around but everyone was really nice it was really cool chilled out space the venue is a bit weird uh, the tobacco dock it's a bit split like there's lots of different rooms and there's there's not it's quite difficult to feel like a sense of belonging and sense of community whereas like when you have these really big halls like when they had it at earl's court or when they do the egx proper which is up in birmingham you know it's all in one really big hall and it's really loud and everyone's together and you really feel like wow there's loads of people here whereas at tobacco dock you know it's separate rooms and stuff like that and it, it, it's a cool space but it's not quite it's not quite the same feeling and yeah just wandering around seeing where things are at in the industry and where the indies are and actually actually i got to play one game while i was there that i really really loved um there are a few games that i played that i liked but there was one that i i thought was uh refreshingly straightforward and i really really liked it and that seems like an underhand way to describe it it's a game called super arcade racing uh, it's by a studio called Out of the Bit. There's not actually that much about this game out there, or at least I, I couldn't find, because I, I went looking for it because I completely forgot what the name of the game was, because it's kind of a generic... What did you play it on? Uh, I played it on an Xbox One pad. I think it was a PC build, um, but I think I think they're bringing it to consoles. In fact, they are. In fact, I'm now looking at the, their thing on the EGX website. It's PC, Mac. It's coming to gaming consoles, uh, whatever that means. I assume PS4 and X1, and probably Switch as well. Uh, and ios and android by the end of 2019 according to this website right here what i am reading actually i think i, play, I might have played it on a switch controller anyway so it's a top-down racer top-down 2d arcade racer and i like racing games and i've come to this realization that i really like arcade racing games and don't judge so it's got a bit of a micro machines feel it's got a very micro machines -y feel in so much as it feels like if you are a connoisseur of those kinds of games and you remember playing let's say for example a, a fantastic Team 17 game called Overdrive. It actually mm -hmm. feels a bit more like Overdrive than it does like Micro Machines. So it has it has speed boosts, for example. It has uh, like little pads that you can drive over that are strategically placed along the along the space. So it, it tries to encourage more of a racing line than Micro Machines does, I think. And it also has slipstreaming. So, for example, if you ever got really annoyed in Micro Machines that, like, you know, your mate would get, like, a few car lengths in front of you and then you'd never really be able to catch up. Well, that's kind of gone with this because you can slipstream behind opponents and then you get a bit of a slingshot effect when you come out of their slipstream and then you, you rock, rock it ahead a little bit. And so there's this idea that, you know, you can always, you know, you can always take that slightly dangerous approach of, like, getting behind someone, getting into a slipstream, getting ahead of them, you know, but you go a little faster so does that skid you out of control and it has a single player which i didn't muck about with because i played it uh, so single screen couch multiplayer with a chap called matthew walker who's the audio person at the studio what i uh, what i work at and um yeah we played it and it's got like a really nice little it's got lots of maps it's a very as i say a straightforward looking 2d 
2D art game. It's not trying to be super flashy. It's not trying to go over the top with where it's at. It actually really does look like a 1990s MS-DOS arcade racer. And actually, I like that about it. Like, it isn't trying to be super flash. It is like, hey, you remember these games? It looks like that. And not not how you remember it looking. It actually just looks like that. And um, and I really liked it. it. I mean, in terms of other things, it is a top-down straightforward arcade racing game so it's not like it's not going to shatter people's expectations it is very much a do you fancy one of these this will be a very good one for you but that being said like yeah i mean i think i think it's ace and i think the commitment to that 90s aesthetic is what distinguishes it from a lot of other top-down races that you see on steam and, and elsewhere like it really does authentically look like those games and i as somebody who grew up playing those games it just it just wiggles away in my tummy it just goes oh oh that's interesting isn't it as oh how does that make you feel and it makes me feel good so uh yeah hopefully uh, this thing's coming out by the end of 20, 2019 and i i've added it uh, to my mental wish list. I don't think it's anywhere to wish list elsewhere, but um but yeah, that was my that was my that was my favorite game at the show. It was an Amiga ass looking 2D racer, which um considering, you know, considering the amazing game, the you know, big AAA games and stuff like that that were there, I think that's um it's something to be said when simplicity just simply makes you go, you know what? Yeah, I'm up for that. It's interesting you say this because we talked about Towerfall Ascension in the last episode, mm. which feels, again, like an older game than it actually is. Yeah. I've been playing a game that came out in October last year, which okay. has that same oldie-worldie video game aesthetic. Okay. It's one bit monochromic. Mm. Uh, Return of the Obra Dinn. <sighs> Ooh, okay, so this has been on my list for a while. I don't know anything about this game other than its art style. Yeah, so it was on my list for a while, and it was recently when I saw that it had run a couple of awards at the BAFTA yep. Games Awards recently, and I was getting bored of Spider-Man. Sam's going to be rolling his eyes <laughs> because I bought the DLC to the Spider-Man oh, game. Oh, mate, come on. And it's done the same thing the Arkham Games has done, which is it's a game you want to play in a short burst and leave it at that because it's too much of a good thing. Yeah. And I'm getting that a lot with Spider-Man at the moment. And playing Return of the Obra Dinn, it's a game that I'm awake at night thinking about it, trying to piece it together. Really? It's, it is one of the best games I've played recently. Ooh. It is astonishing. Okay, so just so just so people have an idea of like what this game is and what like what it is to look at. Yes. So you, what you've got is if you've ever owned one of those old Macintosh computers, that one bit monochromic graphics, just blacks and whites. And the interlacing of those shades gives you different gradients, gotcha. basically. Yeah. So uh, that's it. And it's one of those wonderful things where you you find yourself being caught out at times because the game doesn't seem as if it graphically should be as good as it actually is because it looks so old. Right. You feel like you're playing an emulated version of a game. Right. Like for me, walking around, because it's in first person, so you're turning and you're looking and it's very smooth, but it's in this one-bit graphic style. So it's quite bizarre, hmm. but it really works. And it's amazing how engaged you get in these graphics. If you've ever played, as a board game, if you've ever played Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, yeah. you will absolutely love this. Okay. Uh, if you've ever played any kind of walking simulator, like uh, my favourite, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, mm -hmm. or someone like Gone Home, where you're given these clues and you have to discover them at your own pace, well, imagine now that you actually have to keep a record of what it is you discover, and you will unlock bits of the game by getting correct deductions. Because right. this is a game about deduction or abductive logic. Uh, essentially, it's set in the 1800s. It is 1807. And a ghost ship has returned into port, a ship that is empty, from the East Indian Trading Company. And you've been sent as an agent of this insurance company to, to what, try and work out what exactly happened. And what I mean by that is that you have got to go through this game and account for all 60 crew members. What happened to them, how they died, and where they died, and who killed them if it was a who. And you're given this pocket watch, which essentially is called a memento mortem. Okay. which means that you appear in front of the remains of a dead body, you activate this watch, and it takes you back exactly to a, a, a tableau, interactive tableau, a frozen image of this person's death. Okay. And you're walking around a still image, 
it's a bit like uh, bullet time almost. It's not moving around you, it's completely still, but you get to walk through it and look at how this person is dying. You don't know who this person is, you don't know their name. All you've been given, in addition to this empty book, this, le- this ledger that you have to fill out, mm. is a list of the entire crew, their, their origin, their job, you know, where they're from. You were also given a map of the ship, which tells you where they are, where you are, the location of the ship. You're also told where in the chapter of the story you are. Right. So, for example, um, there's a chapter called Escape, I think. And if I'm in the last part of the escape, I know that anything comes before this will allow me to understand all the, the decisions that were made that got me to this point now. So I'm slowly getting to know who these people are and piecing it together. And the game holds your hand, but it also doesn't hold your hand. It gives you everything you need to make copious notes and get those notes really quickly. So I can hover over a person and it'll show me what their picture is, their portrait in this huge group photograph or painting that was painted by this artist. Mm -hmm. So I can put a face to the face in front of me, but I can't yet put a name. So I'm listening to the snippets of conversation. Did somebody mention a name? Who are they talking to? And trying to work out who that is. Now, oh, hang on, I know who that is. That is uh, the captain, because they said they're the captain. That person there, they're the first mate. Now, if they're the first mate, I know they're the first mate from a previous scene. This scene I'm in now, somebody's following them side by side and assisting them. I'm assuming they must be the assistant to the first mate. Right. And once you've got three of these, what they call fates, when you've got the name, how they died and who killed them, three of these, you get a big tick. The game lets you know, so you can lock these things off. Gotcha. And it's just genius. Mm. Little things, Pete, like I'm listening to the accent of a person to go, hang on, what's that word? Is that German? I look to see if there's anyone German on the ship. So, yeah, that's got to be them. Brilliant. They, oh, they mentioned they've got a friend who's French. I go into a previous scene. There's the two of them talking. That's probably them. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And it's so wonderful to have a game that is robust. There's no holes in this game whatsoever. Right. And it's one of those games which takes time. It takes time to complete, but it's such a satisfying meal to kind of dine out on. Right. I'm really enjoying chipping away at it slowly, slowly, knowing that the puzzle will slowly assemble, because it will assemble, and I completely trust the game to do that. And there's a reason why this has got 10 out of 10 on Steam. Right, it's right, a fantastic right. game. And like uh, little things like when I'm going through a second time now, I'm going back through all the scenes I've been through, because I've not found everyone yet in all these scenes or put a name to a face yet. And I'm realising that actually at the time when I was down here in this bit of the ship, I didn't realise that actually I could have walked out onto the top of the ship because something else was happening up on top, gotcha. which will impact upon what will happen in another bit of the narrative. So it's, it's a very, very smart game. If you love Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, if you want a walking simulator that actually appreciates you for um, making these little connections between characters and narrative plots and threads, this is a game for you. And also... It's not a pedestrian game in terms of its story. Some really weird stuff goes on down in this ship. I'm not going to spoil it, but some really weird stuff. I don't know what happened completely. I don't know why it's happened, because the game starts you at the end. Okay. So I know who's left at the end. I don't know how they got there. So is there, just to, just to not to spoil anything, but like... It feels like, you know, if people are dying, it feels like there is a sense of maybe not horror, but like suspense in there. Is it is it more of a like a Lovecraftian sort of a suspense? Yes, I would say so. Yes, okay. very much so. And that was surprising to me because I didn't know anything about this game going in. I just knew it was a very good mystery. Okay. And there was one there's one particular tableau and the images are absolutely striking. What they do with one bit graphics is extraordinary. Yeah. And I'm just marveling at this thing. Um, There's an explosion, and I'm having to peer into the explosion to see who is in there. Because each tableau has its own little two-page section in the book, Mm. which gives me the person, a picture of the person, and it says, who are they, how did they die, where did they die, and you've got who killed them, and you've got to fill it out. It's like, oh, they died in an explosion, or they were crushed by a cannon, say, for example, Mm. or they were burnt alive. And then uh, below that, I've got, like, I think it's an image of the, the entire crew, and I can see who was also present at that time. And I had a wonderful moment today when I went back for a scene. I thought, hang on, it says that there were six other people here, but I've only counted five. Mm. And I spent a while walking around the ship going, there's got to be another person here, where are they? And I looked up, and there was someone who's just fallen from the rigging into the water, and I'd completely missed them the first Brilliant. time round. Brilliant. Because it's a frozen image. It's not like Arkham Origins, say, for example... Um, where you scrub back through the time and you watch the images unfold, you're getting a single moment, a single frame that is frozen. 
Yeah. And it's amazing how different that frame can look each time you see it. Right. And because you've got all this time, you can really savour it in the same way there's great moments of Sherlock Holmes' consultant detective. And I was really put off by the fact that it's a PC title. You can okay. get it on Mac and PC. Okay. But now, actually, it really lends itself to a PC experience because of flicking through the book, which you do quite often, hovering with the mouse and the cursor. I don't think it would work as well with a console. But I, I, it's a game I would love to play with someone else. I think you'd really enjoy it playing in sittings because it does feel like um, board games such as the aforementioned consultant detective or time stories, say, for example. Honestly, I cannot recommend it enough. I think everyone should play this game. It's 11 quid on Steam. Oh, that's not bad, is it? The way you describe it is what I kind of wanted to get from Mist, but never, just because I just came to it way too late, I just it wasn't a thing I could. But I think, yeah, this, this sounds to me like exactly that sort of like figure it out for yourself world building, which, which I'm a big fan of. And this is from Lucas Pope, who you will know, Pete. He, you put me onto him through um, Tech Papers, please. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. That was that, This is the game they've done after that. Sweet. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I, I cannot recommend it enough. Honestly, I, I, I don't think I've been this excited by a game since Night in the Woods. Okay. That's big. That's big! Um, so everyone should go and, buy, and play it. Go and buy it, go and buy it, etc. Have you heard of Mate? Do you know what mate is? Do you know what Do you know what puera is? No, I don't. I, I assume Pete. Now I'm going to take a guess here. Are you talking about paints? No, 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 no. Do you know what Darjeeling is? Oh, hang on. Now we know. Mm. We're talking about tea. Aren't we're we? talking about tea. Now we're going to have the talk about tea. I previously, my god tier tea was basically just like organic, you know, fair trade. What I thought of as just tea, as in like tea bag, tea, chuck it in the pot, put some milk in, you're done. Don't even chuck it in a pot, pop it in a mug, you're done. But that has expanded somewhat now. So I, I did have a few different herbal teas and stuff like that before this. But I went to, I went with Alex. We got bought a gift by a friend, which is very kind of them, which was for, uh, there's a company called the Bird and Blend Tea Company. And what this company does is they do a, what's called a, tea blending workshop and that's what we got or a tea tasting workshop i think it's maybe both. oh my gosh you created your own tea Pete. i created my own teas chris um oh my so gosh and did you give them names i did give them names i give two of them names so um so the whole okay so here's the setup and i've been very into my very geeky thing so in nutsford for example after uh sam's lovely wedding we decided to stay around in nutsford for a bit and we went to the penny farthing museum because of course, because okay. of course you would. You know, I went to the train museum in York after the after the stag. Because why wouldn't you? And I've been getting into very specific things and trying to figure out, you know, what was the RAF, the birth of the RAF like? I've been trying to do some of that sort of stuff because I've been finding a, a bit of interest in that about like a very specific niche subject and then finding out a bunch of stuff about it because I just think it's cool. And so this has been part of that. And uh, let me tell you. The tea is way more exciting than I thought it was, right? Tea is pretty cool, I would say, in fact. And so we went on this tea testing course thing. And the first thing they do is they get you in. So we went to the one in Bristol. They get you in and you all sit around and everyone's 45 or over except for me and Alex, right? Because, of course, like, it, you know, it's, it's a, a niche thing. It's like we went to go and see the Da Vinci uh, exhibit. Of course, it was full of 55-year-old men and women coughing and spluttering over some expert talking to you about old Leo. And uh, so, so it starts off by them inviting you in. It's all nice. And you get bottomless drinks including booze, all right? So boozy tea things. And I was like, fun. So I sit down and I've got my mo motito mo or mojiti. Do you know, ah, um, Veronica wants to make one of those. We saw a recipe the other day for it. Let, well, let me tell you, uh, or let me tell you to tell Veronica, they are delicious, right? They are absolutely amazing. As is uh, the, hmm, it's called, it was called something like, uh, the clumsy unicorn or the, the the tipsy unicorn or something like that and it's basically a tea drink where there's it's like a blueberry tea thing and then when you pour lemon in the blueberry color changes to pink and you can see the blue and the pink changing and swirling around in the glass it's absolutely delicious and very very fun to watch so you got first of all you've got booze in your hand you've got drinks uh, if you want them you got these things and you're slurping away. And then two very nice people, one person who's preparing everything and one person who's giving you the talk, comes over and talk, starts talking to you all about the his, like teas and where they come from. And you have to figure out 
you know which teas are what so they give you these little samples and they're like oh well what's this and then you're like i don't know what a puera tea is and i don't know what a a mate tea is so then they're like well this is what this is and you give it a sniff and you're like "Mm," and you find out all about all of that sort of stuff and you find out that rubos are not proper teas they're what are called tianines or tiasines or tiasines or something like that and they're basically like there's like five different types of tea that are all from the tea plant and they just basically it's different ways of preparing it right so green tea and white tea and black tea and some other teas they're all tea right they're just regular tea uh, they come from a tea leaf and then like rubos and uh, like herbal teas and stuff like that uh, they are not right they are not from the tea plant itself they're from different things so you learn all about that and you learn about little history and stuff and the way that they they pitch it is you're having a conversation with this person right so at any point any person can just put, stick their hand up and of course me being a complete nerd we're always constantly like well how come this thing so like for example one of the things is that they teach you is that green tea is an anomaly matcha is an anomaly right so generally white tea green tea black tea this is it it goes from least processed to most processed right and the more it gets processed the more caffeine the more it breaks down basically the more it ferments and more caffeine ends up in the in the tea leaves right so in black tea and in puera which is compacted tea which side note they sell in asia in like essentially in blocks these clumped up blocks Uh, because it's processed and pushed into packs and stuff, and it's then left to to age. So there's actually, like, wine auctions, but for tea in Asia. I had no idea about that. So they teach you that that basically the more these things get processed, the more caffeine there is, and the less processed, the, the, the more nutrients there are, right? So here's the thing. And I was like, and I held my hand up, because Sam has always taught me that matcha, which is green tea, is extremely caffeinated, but also very full of antioxidants and full of nutrients. And those two things should not be the same thing. And they say, ah, but matcha is the outsider. Matcha is this one weird instance where that's not the case. And I was like, wow, fascinating. Um, and they were, and you said that out loud, didn't you? That I, bit? I actually did, though, because I was genuinely, I was, I was slightly pissed, but also like, uh, I was like, this is cool. And so there's another tea called oolong, which I've never had before. Well, I don't think I've had before. Maybe I've had it before once but whatever um oolong which is this kind of tea that in asia they brew it i think six times and the first time and and each time you brew it the leaf unfurls a little bit more and that gives you a different flavor and a different texture and a different um a different kind of feel to the whole thing and they say that the more you brew oolong the better the drink becomes so in tea ceremonies they actually throw the first set of tea away and then every other one uh, you know you, you you go through the the ceremony and you have the tea and so forth and there's actually a saying which is the first cup of oolong that you you that you create you give to your enemy whereas like the very last cup of tea that you, you had from the oolong uh, you give to yourself and then the middle is like your wife your mistress your boss <laughs> your friends and all that sort of stuff yeah basically <laughs> um which is um which is yeah it's great so uh, and it's very clearly you know an oldie an oldie sort of uh so crazy. pete what were these teas that you made i'm, so, I'm, I'm excited so, about yeah this. so you did all that and then you go and get to mix your own teas so okay okay so i made a so they give you all the the elements to do and you get you file into a little line you get to do three of them so I did one that was rubos, like cocoa nibs or whatever it was, some orange peel and uh, I think coconut shavings or something along, along those lines. Um, and that's going to be like, um, and actually I'd managed, I managed to pick one that they literally sell. They literally do a version of that. Like, so I was oh like, my word. I was like, they do now. I was like, natural. So I did that one. I didn't give that one a name. That's the one, one, one of them I didn't do. One of them, I love teas that knock you the heck out. Right, like I loved drinking a tea before bed that just like nitol, nitol, but with boiling water in it. Um, uh, so I don't know if you've have you ever had chamomile tea? I used to drink a lot of it, and I can't anymore because I overdosed on it. <laughs> that surprises me. So, um, so I made a mix of chamomile and um i think it was oh lavender rose petals and just some other little soft delicate like flowery things and i called that nighty night well done thank you tm 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 
And then I did another one, which is made with mate, uh, which is where we started this whole thing off with. And mate is a type of tea that is, it's, it's not, again, it's not from the tea plant. It's a tianine or tiocene or whatever it's called. And it has a chemical in it that is not caffeine, but works, but is a stimulant. Okay. Red Bull. <laughs> yeah, just pour it in. It gives you wings, mate. And what it does is it works. It doesn't work on the body. It works on the brain. It only works on the brain. So it doesn't give you the jitters like caffeine does, but it does make you very sharp and very alert. And so I wanted to make a tea that would like, I like teas that wake you up and like make you feel as if you're ready to face the day and all that sort of stuff. So I chose a mate tea. And uh, in that I put like hibiscus and star anise and, oh my gosh. and goji. Quite aromatic. Oh yeah. And goji berries. Right. So like superfood. And I, what did I call that one? I think I called that one tea time to shine. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'm just picturing like the logo. Like, you know how like Twinings has their logo. I can imagine you having like some kind of crest yeah. to make it look as if you're, it's a com- like Werb's original. It's a company that's been around for centuries, yeah. but oh, hasn't really. Yeah. It uses the family crest or whatever it is that I've got. Yeah. Like definitely. And you know what? And, and then at the end of it, so we did all that tea making. Great. Had a lovely time. Alex made three as well. She, she had a lovely time doing it. And then at the end of it, I realised that we don't actually have a kettle. So um, I was like... What do, you mean you, what do you mean you don't have a kettle? I don't have a kettle. Oh, no, I have a kettle, but we don't have a teapot. Right, OK. Yeah, because I, I was about to say, I swear I've had tea at your house. Oh, you've, had a, you've, had a tea, you've had tea. Yeah, so we got the kettle, don't have the teapot bit. So then we were like, at the end of it, they were like, oh, by the way, you get 10% off as a thank you. And I was like, oh, well, all right then. So then we bought a teapot and I bought a stew in the mug, loose leaf tea mug glass mug that's yeah. very nice and that's for work so i'm going to take the mate and stuff like that into work and so yeah have all of that stuff and then and then bought even more teas and then came home with basically like eight different kinds of tea and two new bits of kitchen implements and basically long and short of it chris is i've spent 65 quid on tea wow yeah it's not bad and is you've it? not yeah, and you've not stopped going to the toilet and i've I, absolutely streaming uh so so I've learned a lot. Basically, I've le- I learned so much from this, and I genuinely like. If you live in one of the locations that this these that these uh, bird and blend lot are at, if you like, uh, like just give them a Google and you'll figure out where where they're all at. But if you're in Bristol, for example, or I think there's one in London, it's well worth. If you even if basically if you just vaguely like tea and you think do you know what? I want to do a slightly nerdy thing and have a lovely time and also get boozed up <laughs> with, with with a bunch <laughs> of like fifty five year olds. Honestly, I think it is it is a genuine pleasure. It's a lovely time, and I learned a lot about a thing that I thought I knew stuff about. Uh, and that's the thing that I'm finding more and more and more as I do these res- the, all this research into like World War One stuff, and then like research into trains and research into like all sorts of mad other things that I've just had weird little interests in tea, for example. I thought I knew a lot about specific subjects, and it actually turns out I know absolutely nothing. And I think most people don't know anything. I think most people basically like like they get their pg tips and they put it in a mug and they're like that's tea that's what tea is there you go done and so it's been really nice it's been really exciting to learn more about that stuff and i'll 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 feed back as to what my teas are like because I've, I've, you, you have to leave them like for like 48 hours to uh mix up with one another and take all the lovely flavors into to one another infuse so well, I'll, let, I'll let you know how that goes but pete mm. i also came up with a drink accidentally right the best inventions in the world are by accident. Yes, so, this is true. Uh, wasn't it like, yeah, penicillin, jelly night, I think, was invented by accident by Alfred Noble. Right. Yeah, so uh, it was the night before Lisa and Sam's wedding, and I was staying over at Sam's along with his father and his brother. Rowdy. Yeah, yeah. and Dan. Dan was there. Oh. Dan, who can't be here, unfortunately, because he's moving house. Bless him. So, yeah, so basically it was the night before the wedding. We went to this pub and uh, a local pub and i was getting my drink yes. uh, from the bar yes. and i noticed in the fridge yeah they had cream eggs pete in cream eggs what, in the, in, sorry where is this this is a pub a pub in, uh it's one of sam's local pubs in the fridge with all the you know the bottled beers and the ciders yeah. and the breezes yeah. and that they had cream eggs like, like had about five cream eggs what? crammed at the bottom okay let's just break that that let's break that down for a second cream eggs are not a traditional pub snack no, they're not. Like, but I prefer them to boiled eggs or pickled eggs. Right, but but pickled eggs, yes. Scratchings, very much so. Bad crisps like Brannigans, which are actually really good. Yeah, sure, absolutely. 
But cream eggs, I can't think of many drinks that would pair well with that. Well, you're about to find out, Pete. So I said, well, look, in for a penny, in for a pound, there's the opportunity there. <laughs> and I have this little rule inside, never pass up a cream egg if you see one Yo. there, just so you have to buy one. Yeah, sure. So I love cream eggs. I'm one of those people that loves cream eggs. I know a lot of people don't like them. But it's Easter time as well. So I bought a cream egg. Sure. And I unwrapped it. And I sat at the pub there with my, my cider. Mm. And they only had Strongbow on tap, so I just had oh, my Strongbow cider I'm there. So, I'm sorry, Chris. I'm I sorry. know, I know, I know. I don't like Strongbow either, but it was the only cider they had. And I took a bite out of my egg, top of it. Yeah. Because I had people there. Usually I ate it whole. But yeah, were, sure. You know, like in a public. snake. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this, this, this situation has never, ever presented itself before, where I have pint and egg. Yeah. Those two, as you rightly point out, Pete, never, ever no. coexist usually. Yeah. I thought, what would happen? Yeah. This is how Reese's Peace had invented. What would happen if I dipped cream egg uh. in the Strongbow? So I dip it in there, take a bite. Well, that's, cool. that's all right. I go in for another dip. Yeah. Somebody whacks the top of my hand. <laughs> I think it was Sam or Dan. I can't remember. I let go of egg, sinks to the bottom of my pint. Oh, uh, so, okay. Now, two things happen. One, yeah. as the father of the bride pointed out, it started to look more and more like some kind of testicle. <laughs> Second, my cider with each sip is getting sweeter and sweeter. <laughs> so it's like, by the end of it, it's like having apple tango. It's <laughs> bloody horrible. <laughs> bloody horrible. <laughs> But I'm committed to it. Okay. And okay. Yeah. So go to a second pub. I order. A, I order a, um, a cider. I'm sat there. Yeah. I turn away for one second. I turn back. I hear the splash. I turn back. Sam has dropped another cream egg. Oh, Thankfully f- unwrapped out of its foil. Yeah. And the cream bow, as we've called it, is born, oh, which is what it is. A pint bow. of cream bow. And would you would you recommend? No, I really, really wouldn't, unless you've got a real sweet tooth. Because the problem about that was it had the danger of potentially, if I'd had another one of them, yeah. can you imagine her hangover on cream bow? Oh. It would have had the potential to actually have ruined both cider and cream eggs for me yeah. in one foul swoop. Oh, that's not nice, is so it? So it's a dangerous drink. So do you, at the end of it, is it like a is it like an ice cream screwball where you essentially get something to chew at the end? Or do, is it completely melted into the cider by the end of this? No, it's solid all the way. But it's got, the, but it looks really, really not nice because yeah. you've got the tiny little bubbles around it, are just trapped around the outside of it. It just does not look pleasant whatsoever. Right. Put it this way: if anyone looked at it, you'd always have to keep explaining what it was because it would just look horrible. It was like that. There's that spirit. I think it's about a bottle of what vodka, a bottle of whiskey in America, where it's got like a severed toe in it. Yeah. And it's traditionally you have to drink. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a bit like that. Would you prefer? But this was a cream egg. Okay. Okay. Would you prefer the cream would you, egg or the toe? Were you about toe? to ask me, would I prefer the toe to the cream egg? Yeah. I think the cream egg. Really? Yes. At least with the toe, you can say you've done it. With a cream egg. Yeah, but a toe hasn't got fondant in it. Chris, I'm glad that nobody else is here because nobody's asking me how listeners can get in touch, which I find extremely positive. So basically, we've had a question from Brilliant. Facebook. You can also do it via Twitter and email. Ah, fall into the pattern of doing it. Stayinginpod at gmail.com is the email address at stayinginpod on everything else. And the question comes from Robin Zwicker. I'm going to go ahead and say Zwicker. It might be Zwicker. Or Zwicker. Or Zwicker, maybe. Thank Let's you, know. Robin. Let's know, Robin. And thank you very much for your question. This is Robin Z, uh, who we talked about uh, a a couple of episodes ago uh, maybe confusing him with a group of robins but it turns out it's not a group of robins in a trench coat it's actually a a nice man Uh, so robin asks if brexit was a board game how would it play and how would you rate it oh my gosh so we don't obviously we did do that we did do a couple of episodes ago we did get a little bit have i got news for you so let's let's have Uh, a i mean (laughs) has flipping a coin been trademarked by hasbro or anything i (laughs) I don't know. If it was a board game, what sort of mechanics do you think it would include? Uh, I would say, I would say certainly a high portion of luck. Like, definitely a, a luck based game in some ways. I'm thinking, I'm thinking hand management. Because you've got to yeah. make sure, you know, in your hand have you got supplies for when they potentially run dry? Yeah. <laughs> for example. 
What else? Social deduction. Social deduction. If there's one thing Brexit has done, it has definitely, definitely... Um... It needs an app. It needs someone like werewolf style. Saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Conservatives, open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dearie me. So there's that. What else? I think also probably the playtime would be in a, around, on the back of the box, you know where it says like two to four players, yeah. that kind of thing, and like time span 15 to 45 minutes. I think this one would definitely be like, you know, two hours to three or four years. <laughs> something, yeah. something like that. Like, something like that or lots of expansions. Yeah, lots of expansions or extensions, as you would call them. What else? Um, dexterity. Dexterity. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, you've got a, you know, you might have to run, for example. Yeah. You might you might have to run at some point to get away some from some kind the... of flicking, yeah. Worker yeah. placement. Worker placement. Definitely worker placement. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of this is about worker placement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Do you reckon you could? Do you reckon you could play it as a solo campaign if you just made some amendments for the rules? It's I got feel, a one player. Mode. I feel like some people think they've done a solo variant, but I think really the more players, not the better, but certainly just lots of players. Um, so I think with all that skirting around, <laughs> that's probably what we think how a board game would play. And how would you rate it, Chris? Oh my gosh, rate it in terms of difficulty? Like if it was going to get a board game geek score on it? Yeah, the BGG. Score. Score, which is kind of arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a game which doesn't have a win mechanic or win state, so it's pretty tough, if I'm honest. Yeah, okay, yeah. So not, not yeah, okay. So not really a, a, like, in the same category as stuff like The Mind, not really a game, yeah. as it were. You know those games where, like, even when you've lost, you've, you've still enjoyed the experience? Yeah. This isn't that. No. That was Staying In with Peter Willington and myself, Chris Darby. If you've enjoyed this episode, even though there's only two of us, make sure to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You know the drill. If you'd like to leave a review too, we'd be really chuffed to bits. Now, I know we didn't get to it in the episode, but if you still want to join our Charity Miles team raising money for a charity of your choice and you are still able to do so, just head to your app store Download Charity Miles for your mobile telephone and look for us in the app at hashtag staying in pod. That's all one word, hashtag staying in pod. Today we have 29 members and we have reached the grand total of 2,246 miles. That's amazing. Uh, just a little quick shout out to Winston, Lindsay Bluff and Graham Burrows. Thank you very much for joining us. Free members there among the 29 who are striving forwards to try and help us get to our target of a thousand pounds by the end of the year. Anyway, that's enough from me. See you in two weeks. Bye.